Welcome to the Litigation Psychology Podcast brought to you by Courtroom Sciences. We are thrilled, absolutely thrilled to have Phil Willman. Uh, Phil, how are you doing up there in St. Louis? And is your weather nearly as good as mine, as you can see in this backdrop? It is absolutely gorgeous here. It's sunny and cool and green and everything. It's, it's beautiful. Now, I've it's lived... Yeah, I, I lived in the middle. I lived in Chicago for 15 years. And what I know about the month of May, it, it, it's beautiful today. It's probably going to be snowing tomorrow. Right? <laughs> so true. Absolutely true. Well, thank you so much for coming uh, on the podcast. And there's so many important things to discuss. Um, let's start with, uh, D I've noticed DRI um, really shooting out a lot of emails uh, with a lot of educational opportunities during the pandemic. A lot of them related to COVID-19 uh, for both clients and law firms to sign up for. Um, how come I've not seen any webinars about the murder hornets, which are the next big problem that we're going to face here. You, you've, you've had to read, read about this, right? I have read about it, yes. I, I've not seen any DRR, uh, DRI-sponsored uh, webinars yet, so you, you guys need to get the ball rolling with those, okay? We'll get on it. <laughs> I don't know what sort of litigation could come out of that, but there's probably going to be something. There's some probably going to be probably going to be something with the murder hornets but no back to the uh, real issue can you talk yeah. about some of the internal discussions uh with with you guys uh, uh particularly within dri on how you're handling this pandemic and and trying to get education out there to the defense bar well it's a cliche but out of this uh, pandemic are some opportunities for our organization for years we have been discussing changing the platform that we use for education and not relying so heavily on the big box seminars. This is forcing us to do that and look at online programming, interactive programming, streaming, different ways of, of uh, presenting content to, to uh, our members. And so it's forced us to do that and that's, that's what, uh, you know, what you're seeing. I've been working a lot with Johnny Brown, who's uh, taking care of all that stuff uh, for you. I think I've done eight webinars already uh, for DRI. They've been really well attended. Um, I believe they're using Zoom as the format, the, the platform for that. Those have been going very well. And I think you're right. It's really forced everybody to um, come up with some new ideas. The problem I was having with DRI meetings, I'd go there to present and you know, if you get the two thirty or the three o'clock speaking slot, ha half your membership's on the golf course. The other half of them are in the lobby bar, uh, or out by the pool, depending on the location. And um, you know, they are expensive, and there's a lot of travel involved. But I think I think the webinars are great. Please keep those up and let us know how we at Courtroom Sciences can continue to uh, contribute. You know, one of the most recent ones we did for you, which. Uh, this is a problem. It's been a problem. It's going to continue to be a problem unless there's some major changes uh, in, in the defense bars, the whole concept and phenomena of the nuclear verdict. Um, at DRI, I imagine there's been a lot of talk about this and, and probably internally with your own uh, law firm. W what are your perceptions uh, of the nuclear verdicts? You know, the one thing we that we said very early in our webinar is that uh, this is nothing new. It used to be called the runaway jury back in the 80s and 90s, and now it's just, now they call it the nuclear verdict. But there are some pretty disturbing uh, uh, verdicts um, out there. What has your firm talked about internally on, on maybe changing your playbook around to make sure that you can prevent these for your clients? Well, I think the way to begin the discussion is to look at what is the root of, of that happening. And, and I think one of, and one of the, the things that we have talked about as a firm, but all more more significantly in DRI is millennials as as jurors and and what what is it because I think that's where a lot of this is, is being driven is by the younger members of of the jury and a good better better understanding of of who they are and, and what they've been through. I mean, it's a, it's a generation that went through Enron, it's, it's a generation that distrusts uh, institutions. And many times the, the defendants, the, you know, the, the organizations we are defending are corporations or businesses, which there's a, you know, in, incredibly high distrust of right now uh, because of 
uh, uh, things like Enron and other, other disasters in the past. So that's where you begin the discussion and get a better understanding of, of, of that distrust. And so, yeah. the, you know, I, I think one way to address it is to try to build that trust, uh, starting with, you know, in a jury trial, starting with wire deer. Totally agree. Uh, another interesting topic that came up during our webinar, which uh, is really scaring everybody to death, and I don't blame them, is this whole notion of third-party litigation financing for plaintiffs. That's been a game changer. What, if anything, can the defense bar do to, to try to counter that? Because when you have an adversary that has an open checkbook, just blank check, and they're able to do things that the defense can't do, that really puts you in a very, very difficult position, doesn't it? It does, and it brings up all kinds of ethical issues for, as well. I mean, they, does, you know, the way that that can affect settlement can affect whether a case goes to trial. So what DRI has been doing through our Center for Law and Public Policy is we're beginning to push for <clears throat> legislation or rule changes that would require through discovery um, that information uh, has to be disclosed. That, you know, if, if there's a third party that has a, an interest, that that has to be disclosed. That's, that's the first step that we're taking. Uh, so that at least you, we know, because I don't think people really know. There's really no way to, uh, to, to know that. Um, and it's, you know, that's part of, the, part of the litigation, that there's another party who has a financial interest, a significant financial interest in many uh, respects. And one industry in particular um, that's actually getting some great PR right now is the trucking industry. But boy, they've been just absolutely clobbered by these nuclear verdicts. So we're trying to, to, to work specifically with that industry to help them out, to give them the, the weaponry to help them prevent um, nuclear verdicts. Uh, is, your, is your firm handling any trucking work? Yeah, I don't personally, but we have a pretty substantial uh, trucking practice. Um, and, and, and what are some of the things, because um, obviously you've, you, you've read about some of these just horrific verdicts against uh, trucking companies. And I think part of that that's feeling it um, is uh, the reptile folks have really sunk in their claws into the trucking industry. And they've been in the crosshairs uh, for t some time. I know that you guys um, um, put on your, your partners meeting and, and firm meetings to help educate. And, and I even spoke at one of those with you. We did a reptile talk together. Um, are you still talking internally about um, the evolution of uh, the reptile tactics and trying to educate your folks internally on, on how to derail that reptile attack? Sure. Yes, we're doing that internally. Yeah. And plot is to you and, and your company that, you know, that's what you do in terms of uh, at, the, at the very beginning, witness preparation. That's probably the most important part of it is, is um, preparing witnesses, you know, truck drivers for, for what, what to expect and how, how to, uh, to handle those, that line of questioning. That's, the, that's, you know, the bare minimum that has to, that needs to be done to, to uh, attack the reptile. I, th I think it's the number one most important thing. Um, thankfully, we've cracked the reptile code. We have the antidote here to, to, to take uh, care of this. I think oftentimes the problem is we get the call way too late. And when you have the depositions already recorded, particularly on videotape, you know, in the can, and then you're stuck with those going to trial. Can you maybe describe to me that pit in your stomach when the plaintiff attorney hits play at trial and you have to watch your client or, or, or your client's employees on videotape getting reptiled and looking really bad? Kind of, what does that do to you as a d defense attorney? Uh, it's a sinking feeling, uh, lo loss, loss of control, lack of control, you know, that you can't, you can't unravel uh, what, what has happened. That's, that's the, the, the second feeling is loss of control, not being able to um, position your, your, your case the way that you want to and should. And again, the good news, it is 100% preventable with early interaction uh, with your, you know, whether it be safety directors or drivers, well, really in any industry, I know that you guys do a lot of uh, healthcare litigation. I think they've, try to jump ahead of this and get people um, 
uh, properly prepared uh, for deposition testimony so it's not coming back to haunt them down the road. Now, this is a perfect segue into the next topic is tell me about your experiences with um, we're doing a lot of virtual witness preps to prepare witnesses for uh, deposition. Tell us about your experiences with doing virtual depositions and maybe some of the pros and cons that you've come across. Well, I mean, the, the, the pros are the accessibility, the ease um, at which it can be done instead of travel and, and lost time, that it, it, it can be done instantaneously and easily. That's one of the biggest pros. The con still, I think, is that lack of human contact. Um, even though on virtually you can get a sense of who the witness is. And that's a very important part of what we do as trial lawyers is to size up the witness. Is it somebody who gets angry, upset, nervous, or is confident, cool? That's part of our, our assessment. And I think it's a little harder to do that virtually. It's not impossible, but it's much more, more um, imprecise than actually having that, that, um, that personal contact, that face-to-face -face, yeah. uh, contact. H have, you seen, have you seen it maybe be helpful in a way that perhaps plaintiff attorneys, particularly the real aggressive ones, they're, they're, <laughs> they're not able to maybe intimidate the witness um, as they would if they're sitting a couple of feet, feet away. Have you noticed maybe the temperature cooling down in the, the video depths versus the face-to-face? -face? Yes, because there's a, you know, that's the, that's the flip side of it, that emotional separation can work in, in, in favor of that, that it's, it's, it gives some insulation to the defendant witness. Um, you know, they're not going to be as easily um, pushed into uh, emotions that they don't, that they shouldn't be uh, showing. So yeah, yeah, it does give that, give some separation. I think we're probably gonna continue to see this for quite some time, probably depending on what, what region of the country you are in. Um, final topic, has, have there been any discussions within DRI on kind of when more the face-to-face -face, um, uh, seminars are gonna be? Is there any type of, I'm not asking you to give me a, uh, a precise date, but just maybe some general idea, because I do think th there's going to be some point where um, these meetings are going to uh, continue. Has there been any discussion of that on, on maybe how or when that's going to happen? The face-to-face? -face? Well, you know, we're, we're taking it um, very incrementally. Right now, we're rescheduling some of the seminars later in the year with the hope and expectation that there'll be a way to do it with social distancing perhaps yeah. with with some of the other uh, guidelines that are that are being followed so that's our hope and belief that we'll be able to do some some of that what you know i mean the, the component that we cannot uh, replace with uh, virtual programming uh with our seminars is networking yes and, and that i just I mean, you can have virtual cocktail hours but it just it just doesn't do it. So that's that's our biggest dilemma is, is how to to uh, provide that to our members, which is now is a very very important part of uh, being a member of DRI is, is the ability to network with clients, obviously, but also with other lawyers and, and other professionals. So, but that's our hope is that late fall uh, winter that we'll be able to get back to some semblance of um, in person seminars. And it might be a mix. It might be some of it is online, some of it is stream, and some of it is is person to person. So that's that's a possibility, and we're looking at that. We're also looking at at um, some of the uh, platforms for uh, virtual conferences that on the size of of the seminars, you know, two hundred to six hundred people, which you can't really do with Zoom. But but there are some platforms that we're looking at that um, can provide that to us. Well, keep us posted. Phil, thank you so much for being on the podcast. You're doing a wonderful job um, at DRI. So keep up the good work and go Cubs. <laughs> and go Cards. Hey, and uh, I just want to thank you and your firm. You've been wonderful partners for many years with DRI. You provide uh, 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 significant um, uh, training to, to our members. So we, we much appreciate that partnership and relationship.
And we love working with you guys as well. And we want to continue that into the future as much as we can. So keep in touch and we'll talk to you soon. Sounds good. Bye-bye.